Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Premier Kenny and uh, MLA Michaela Glasgow, who represents uh, Brooks Medicine Hat. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to meet with the Minister of Public Safety and the Minister of Justice to talk about firearms policy in Canada. My advice to them at that meeting was to consult broadly, make sure you talk to law-abiding firearms owners, and make sure you really think through this policy that the federal government was pursuing. Instead, we got a hastily developed policy that simply has frustrated Albertans from corner to corner in our province. Uh, we've received so many people have out reached out to our office to express their concern. And what we've heard from them is that they don't want policy de developed in downtown Toronto. They want policies developed right here in Alberta to reflect their needs and what they want done in our province. We express as well to, to Ottawa our frustration that when it comes to gun crime, the vast majority of this is coming from illegal guns brought into our country from the United States. About 80% of the guns are brought in from the United States that are found in crimes. That's where the focus should be, targeting organized crime to make sure that people are safe in their communities. And we're also going to stand up to make sure we have an Alberta-made justice system. Earlier this week, the Premier announced that we're going to be establishing an Alberta parole board. That means we're going to have more Alberta and less Ottawa in our justice system. And with that, I'd like to introduce our Premier. Thanks very much, Doug, and uh, thanks as well to Michaela for joining us for an important announcement today about uh, asserting Alberta and defending law-abiding Albertans against a federal attack against their uh, rights as law-abiding firearms owners. Alberta has a long history of responsible firearms ownership. In fact, it goes back to our very beginning as a province. And uh, be it hunting, sport shooting, or farmers and ranchers using guns for predator and pest control. While some people in faraway places like Toronto may not, may not understand the reality, hundreds of thousands of Albertans are simply use firearms as part of everyday life. Those law-abiding Albertans should not be used as scapegoats for the actions of criminals by politicians in Ottawa. Uh, the opposition uh, to the former Liberal uh, Long Arm Registry was strongest here in Alberta of any part of Canada. Albertans rightfully understood that treating farmers and duck hunters like criminals would do nothing to deter criminals uh, who by definition don't care about the consequences of breaking laws. Canada uh, does have strong gun control measures, measures that we support, including licensing and background checks. Licensed firearms owners are actually subject to an automatic criminal background check every single day. Restricted firearms are tightly re regulated, including how they are stored, transported, and safely used. Ammunition capacity is limited. Handguns have been registered in Canada since the 1930s. Unfortunately, the, however, there are some politicians who prefer to go after easy targets being law-abiding Canadians and their legally obtained property instead of focusing on the drug gangs and criminal smugglers who willfully endanger lives every day. Such actions illustrate the huge gulf between the federal and provincial government's approaches to combating crime and to responsible firearms ownership. Put simply, while some in Ottawa believe in targeting legally purchased inanimate objects, Alberta believes in targeting actual criminals who represent a threat to public safety. That's why I'm very pleased to announce today two new actions by Alberta's, Alberta's government. First, we are creating an Alberta Firearms Advisory Committee to advise the provincial government on firearms policies under our provincial jurisdiction. The committee's 12 members will include three MLAs uh, to be chaired by Michaela Glasgow of Brooks Medicine Hat and joined by Valley View's Todd Lowen and Onaway's Shane Getson, as well as retired law enforcement officers, hunters, sportsmen and sportswomen, collectors, and a former member of the Canadian Armed Forces. These women and men are exemplars of responsible gun ownership with broad knowledge and expertise. I'm confident that they'll provide the Minister of Justice with thoughtful, sensible ideas to help us craft policies for responsible Alberta firearms owners. 
The second action that we're announcing today is designed to strengthen Alberta's justice system's ability to prosecute real gun crimes. As our Crown prosecutors will tell you, the lack of a provincial testing facility for firearms weakens their ability to bring accused violent criminals to trial in a timely fashion. The Calgary Police Service already has a testing facility and the Edmonton Police Service is in the process of establishing one. But all other police forces in Alberta currently rely on the RCMP's National Forensic uh, Laboratory Services in Central Canada to perform this basic procedure. And today they are waiting on an average of roughly eight months for the results. And that, of course, includes the RCMP that provides police services through, throughout rural Alberta. This puts successful prosecutions at risk, that eight-month delay. And due to the Supreme Court of Canada's Jordan decision, long delays in the justice process can result in criminal prosecutions, including those involving uh, gun crimes, from being, uh, being dismissed outright and allowing criminals to go scot-free. So that's why I'm pleased to announce that the government of Alberta is partnering with the Calgary Police Service, the Edmonton Police Service, the RCMP, and the Alberta Law Enforcement Response Teams to patriate all of the province's firearm testing to the lab in Calgary and the forthcoming Edmonton Police Service facility in Edmonton. This will speed up the testing process uh, to ensure that no prosecution of a gun crime gets derailed because tests are being held up down in Ottawa. Both the, uh, these actions that we are announcing today are needed uh, because of Ottawa's failure properly to balance the prosecution of criminals with the protection of the rights of law-abiding citizens. If Ottawa really wants to protect Canadians from gun crime, it should massively increase resources for the interdiction of uh, firearms being smuggled across the U.S. border. And most of that is happening, again, in central Canada. And it should stop uh, the revolving door justice system and slap on the wrist sentences for violent gangsters, mainly from uh, drug gangs who are behind most of the firearm-linked uh, fatalities in Canada. We sincerely hope that the federal government comes to realize this. Now, as I mentioned a few days ago, we'll be appointing an Alberta Chief Firearms Officer to replace Ottawa's appointee, and uh, there is a motion before the legislature on that subject, which will be further debated tonight. And we are studying the possibility of further actions based on the advice of the new committee that we're setting up today, and this could include supporting the likely legal challenges coming forward from Albertans and other Canadians uh, to challenge uh, uh, aspects of the Ottawa's recent regulatory overreach. These concrete steps are moving us towards a system of firearms administration in the province that is rooted in the values and the priorities of law abiding Albertans. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, MLA Glasgow to say a few words. Thank you, Premier, and thank you, Minister. Good morning. I consider it to be a honour and a privilege to be asked to chair the Alberta Firearms Advisory Committee. Advocating on behalf of Albertans for private property rights has always been a priority for me, and that includes the right to lawfully owning firearms. Since being elected, I have stood up in the House on more than one occasion to speak about Albertans, Alberta's proud history of responsible gun ownership. I grew up around firearms. I was always taught that safety came first and that guns were useful tool tools for life when employed in a safe fashion. When the federal government instituted its gun grab on Canadians, I have to say that I, as well as a large majority of my constituents, were appalled. Many Albertans have expressed a deep desire for more autonomy from Ottawa. I hear about it regularly. The passing of C-71 last year imposed unnecessary red tape, fees and hurdles on law-abiding citizens and business owners. And the recent order in council from Justin Trudeau and his government will now force hardworking, responsible, law-abiding Albertans to hand over their private property and Albertans are rightly frustrated. I am too. And to add insult to industry, in injury, Ottawa is always also entertaining the idea of allowing municipalities to ban handguns. 
Municipalities are under the direct purview of the provinces and frankly, Alberta has had enough of Ottawa's meddling. This is overreached to the nth degree. Albertans want less Ottawa, not more. These recent attacks on gun owners' rights will do absolutely nothing to address the core issues that lead to gun violence. Gang activity, illegal weapons smuggling, the drug trade, the list goes on. These are the issues that the federal government should be focused on, keeping everyone safe. We need firearms policies that recognize and support the ability of Albertans to own and possess firearms in a lawful and responsible manner. I truly am looking forward to engaging with all Albertans, including farmers, ranchers, hunters, and shooting sports enthusiasts, to ensure that this well-capable committee provides advice to the government that accurately reflects the values of responsible Albertans. Thank you. Okay, we'll get the Q&A started. Operator, could you please put through the first caller? First is Graham Thompson with iPolitics. Go ahead, Graham. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, taking my um, call. I was just wondering, um, Premier, you know, we haven't seen the Fair Deal um, panel's report yet. But based on the fact that you're looking at, uh, of course, appointing your own chief firearms officer and also uh, potentially the Alberta Parole Board, is this sort of a precursor to, are you leaning then towards an Alberta police force and an Alberta pension plan? So, Graham, we will be releasing the Fair Deal panel report uh, in a couple of weeks. We wanted uh, time to digest it and uh, discuss it, both as Cabinet and Caucus. Uh, and, uh, in fact, we were just uh, doing that earlier today. Um, and uh, I look forward to advancing the discussion about how Alberta can get uh, a, a Fair Deal in Canada, not just a discussion, but concrete actions. Uh, and, uh, it, as you know, uh, one of the issues we uh, asked the Fair Deal panel to look at is whether we should be creating an Alberta Provincial Police Force. We had one uh, in this province in our the earliest decades of our history, until the 30s, uh, and uh, of course Ontario and Quebec have their own provincial police services. This is not really relevant to the big to most of our cities that have their own municipal police forces, but it is very relevant for rural Albertans who depend on the RCMP as uh, as their local police force through the uh, contract we have with Ottawa. And uh, the, uh, Doug here can tell you, as can Michaela and so many of our of our MLAs, about the profound frustration uh, that rural Albertans have felt uh, coping with the rural crime wave in recent years, uh, the unacceptable response times, um, and the perception that often management decisions are being taken in distant Ottawa uh, for uh, an urgent situation here on the ground. And there's a lack of understanding about uh, about the local reality sometimes in, in, this, in those RCMP management decisions. Um, and so uh, we think there, there is a, a, a a, a, a real issue here. Um, we've not met, made any final decisions um, and uh, I would just say stay tuned for the Fair Deal panel. Uh, we, uh, and I, I have asked uh, uh, Solicitor General Schweitzer um, to come forward with, uh, with options in this regard uh, for the government to consider um, and uh, of course this could be an important part of, of asserting a stronger Alberta in the Canadian Federation but again no final decisions have been taken. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Chris Varco with the Calgary Herald. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, this is a question for the Premier. Uh, Premier, is the province considering a ban on commercial uh, rent evictions as British Columbia has adopted and the Alberta Chambers of Commerce and the CFIB are uh, calling for? Yes, we are considering that, uh, Chris. Uh, f first of all, uh, I think a commercial landlord would have to be uh, darn your brain dead to evict a uh, viable commercial tenant during this crisis because there's just nobody stepping up to fill empty storefronts. Uh, I, I can't imagine how that makes any business sense to evict uh, commercial tenants. Uh, I would uh, uh, strongly urge uh, commercial landlords to uh, give distressed commercial tenants uh, a, a lifeline at this time to get their affairs back in order post-pandemic. Uh, it's, I think, in the interests of both landlords and tenants. Secondly, the uh, federal, provincial, uh, commercial tenant 
uh, subsidy program, in w which, which we've announced our participation at a cost of $67 million, uh, is there to support landlords who themselves may be facing financial distress. Uh, and, um, yeah, and yet we are hearing more and more stories from small businesses about landlords who are refusing to participate in that. Their participation in it would, would reduce by 75% uh, the uh, commercial rent payable by tenants um, with the balance being offset by the provincial and federal governments. So at the very least, we would uh, ask those commercial landlords to uh, participate in that program. And we are looking, if they refuse to do that, we are looking at uh, options similar to the one adopted by uh, British Columbia. I understand Saskatchewan and some other provinces are considering it as well. And so I would just say stay tuned uh, for um, an announcement in the near future in that respect. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Janet French with CBC. Go ahead, Janet. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. So, I mean, the federal ban that was just introduced was related to assault-style weapons, is the terminology they're using. I'm just hoping you can help me understand, and I'm not sure which of you is best versed in firearm use, how many farmers and duck hunters need access to assault-style guns, and what sorts of tasks do they use them for? There, uh, Janet, there have been uh, thousands of categories of firearms uh, recently banned by order in council, uh, all of which have been legally obtained, legally used by people with uh, possession acquisition certificates, uh, which means they've gone through rigorous safety training, background checks, and constant uh, police checks as well, cr criminal record checks. Uh, so uh, these are firearms that, that Canada, including this gov federal government, has always considered to be uh, safe and legal. These uh, these generally have, have not been res restricted or prohibited fire, obviously not prohibited, but they've not been even restricted. Many of these are, are basically um, uh, firearms that, that have, uh, the exter have, have been used legally and safely by hundreds of thousands of Canadians. Um, and so you can put all sorts of, you know, uh, Hollywood words on on them to characterize them, but these are firearms again that that have been used uh, and are possessed legally by by Albertans and Canadians. Um, and and by the way, in the amongst the thousands of categories that have been uh, prohibited by federal fiat in uh, the last couple of weeks are shotguns uh, that are in wide use by uh, by farmers and ranchers as as tools in in agriculture. So uh, the bottom line is that, um, and you know what? The federal government has actually come forward with an exemption for the application of these rules to Indigenous Canadians, to members of First Nations, uh, because they recognize that many of these uh, firearms are used uh, in the uh, exercise of treaty protected uh, hunting and trapping rights. So on the one hand, the federal government is saying that these are, are firearms that are used legitimately for, for hunting, and they, they recognize there's a treaty right enjoined there. On the other hand, uh, they're, taking a, uh, they're applying a double standard. Doug, do you want to yeah. fill anything in, in there? Uh, the only other point that I would add to the Premier's comments there is that this is about smart policy versus policy that hasn't been thought through. By investing a half million dollars, we can take the delay from eight months down to weeks to make sure we, we can prosecute cases in, under the time constraints of Jordan. This is smart policy versus half-baked policy that's going to cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Ottawa could have invested $500,000 to speed up the process to make sure that we get our, our prosecutions done on a timely basis. They didn't do that. Instead, they're targeting law-abiding Albertans. Their priorities are misplaced. Yeah, I'll just add one other point. And, and I'll just add one more point, which is if the goal is to um, reduce firearms crimes, then they should be redoubling efforts to stop the illegal uh, importation of the kind of firearms that are used by gangs and criminals in Canada. And uh, and so uh, it, you know, again, it's 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 not it should that the, the target should not be law-abiding farmers and hunters in rural Alberta, the target should be the folks, the criminal gangs that are bringing um, thousands of illegal firearms across the border, primarily in Ontario and Quebec. Did you want to add to that, Michaela? Sure. 
Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. French. I think the, the biggest thing here is that Albertans are feeling frustrated with overreach from Ottawa. And this is just one more example of the federal government um, really not understanding the needs of everyday Albertans. And those Albertans um, have relied on the tradition and passing on tradition to family members, including some of these in these what will now be prohibited firearms. Um, at the end of the day, um, as an MLA, as, as a member of this government, our, our obligation is to speak to Albertans and hear their interests, which is exactly what this panel will be doing, this committee will be doing to provide uh, advice to the minister. And uh, we really need to be protecting private property rights, especially of Albertans who have firearms that have been legally obtained and in many cases passed along for generations. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. Hi there. This is a question for the Premier. Uh, you said uh, as recently as yesterday on Facebook uh, that you're considering speeding up Phase 2 of the economic relaunch and potentially moving some things from Phase 3 uh, forward into Phase 2. Uh, can you tell us specifically what you're thinking in terms of the timeline, what you would need to see to make that call, and what risks you see in moving ahead more aggressively, only to be put in a situation where you would have to undo some of that if we see a spike in cases? Well, let me just to say that uh, final decisions have not yet been taken. Uh, we'll have an announcement early next week about uh, Phase 2. Uh, and uh, the, here's the great news. Uh, the numbers have continued to move in very much in the right direction. We're down to just over 50 people uh, with COVID in Alberta hospitals, uh, only five or six in intensive care, uh, and I think only one or two using ventilators. Uh, so. We have, we have successfully flattened the curve, uh, which was always the main goal of, this, uh, of our COVID response. Uh, we flattened the curve and, and we now have um, been able to move from 2,800 designated COVID acute care beds uh, to 1,000 designated acute care COVID beds with only 4%, 4 or 5% utilization on that. So, um, we are performing, Albertans are doing extraordinarily well in this regard. Uh, yesterday, I believe we had uh, only 13 new uh, confirmed infections reported on about 3,000 tests. Uh, of course, this is not yet over and we must continue to be vigilant. We'll have to continue to uh, maintain uh, common sense public health measures. And at the end of the day, it's really up to Albertans just to be uh, patient and rigorous about following the hygiene guidelines, the frequent washing of hands and physical distancing, all of that, follow the advice of the chief medical officer. Um, but uh, it is, uh, I can say that, that uh, uh, we've been in discussions with the chief medical officer uh, and uh, through her, her team. And, and I think there is a high level of, of confidence that we can move forward um, with uh, the phase two of relaunch and to possibly move forward some of the activities that initially had been planned for uh, phase three uh, into phase two. Um, so that's, that's what I can tell you at this point. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Lisa Johnson with Post Media. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I mean, uh, Minister Schweitzer, you mentioned a $500,000 investment. Is that going directly towards gun testing, and what would be the, the total cost of the committee or the end date, if there is one in mind? And I'm also wondering, I mean, you mentioned uh, potential handgun bans, um, MLA Glasgow. I'm wondering, are you saying you would consider moving to stop municipalities <clears throat> looking at handgun bans? And I'll ask the, answer the first question regarding the, uh, the firearms testing. Uh, that funding is about a half million dollars to expand the scope here. Uh, we do about 600 tests a year, but this will give us capacity to do 750 firearms tests a year. Uh, and this will be built out in collaboration with Calgary Police and Edmonton Police. Uh, that funding for that will, be come, will come through the Alberta Law Enforcement Response Team funding that we have here in the province of Alberta. Uh, and just to speak about uh, the federal government's intention to bring forward uh, enhanced powers for municipalities, uh, earlier this year when I met with uh, the respective minis federal ministers, I mentioned to them that this is a no-fly zone in Alberta. We clearly have provincial jurisdiction here. They simply cannot bypass us to go to municipalities. This is our provincial jurisdiction. Alberta will always fight to preserve our rights under the Constitution. Uh, Michaela, do you have anything else you want to add? Sure. Um, 
just further to Minister Schweitzer's comments, he, he went over the legal aspect of this, but at the end of the day, the, the role of the committee is to consult with everyday Albertans and provide common sense solutions as well as a, a concise plan and recommendations for the minister. So that's what we'll be doing. We'll be consulting with everyday Albertans and we'll be hearing their feedback on that. And um, if it's any indication of what I've heard so far, it's that um, Albertans by and large are frustrated with this government's overreach. And this is another example of that. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Next is Neil Vaughn with Alberta Outdoorsman Magazine. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, my question is for the Premier. I mean, it's, by the way, I, as the Premier knows, it's Neil Waugh, not Vaughn or whatever that is. But This is Neil, uh, Premier, Neil Waugh? Yes. My the, gosh, Neil, it's been, for, it's been ages. Yes. But, but anyway, back to, down to business here. Now, you've just announced, um, wait for a drum roll, a committee. And also, you've announced some money, some spending for something that the, Royal, that the RCMP should be doing by themselves with their provincial budget rather than enhancing it, especially in a time when you're still practicing restraint. Uh, in the meantime, my understanding is Alberta legit, legitimate law-abiding gun owners are now receiving threatening letters from the federal government. Now, I haven't gotten mine yet, but I, but I have heard others had. Why aren't you... Uh, proactively going after the federal government to make them uh, you know, getting cease and desist orders st standing in place until you can get this whole question of jurisdiction and legality resolved by the courts. Well, you know, we are taking sure. action. We we have uh, announced that we'll be creating an Alberta a provincial uh, chief firearms officer. When you were covering Ralph Klein back in the day, that's something he decided not to do. Uh, we have uh, we're saying that. Uh, Personnel is policy, and an Alberta-based chief firearms officer can apply the law in a common sense way that reflects the reality on the ground in this province. That is a, a very important, a step, concrete step forward. Uh, the uh, and 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 that uh, the whole development of a firearms. Uh, office in, in Alberta will in part be informed by the advice we get from the committee where uh, that MLA Glasgow will be chairing um, and the other measure here look here's our point our point is not just about protecting the legitimate rights of legal law-abiding firearms owners but also tackling firearms crime and that's why we're taking a concrete step today you're, you're right Neil uh, RCMP should have brought the um, uh, the the firearms uh, lab here to Alberta a long time ago. They shouldn't have these eight month wait times, but the reality is that they do. And if we weren't to take this action and invest uh, this money now, uh, we would still be waiting eight months. And and one of the ways that we can uh, protect the rights of legal firearms owners is to crack down on the criminal abuse of firearms. And it will be easier to do so, getting faster results uh, from the, uh, the lab uh, based here in Alberta. So that's concrete action uh, that we're taking. Doug, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, I, I, <clears throat> he's talking about cease and desist. Yeah. Quite sure. So right now, uh, we're actually working through with uh, law enforcement here in Alberta, as well as with our prosecution service, uh, to make sure that we have a made in Alberta policy when it comes to the enforcement of firearms laws that are federal jurisdiction. Uh, but we're working through to make sure we have a consistent policy in the province of Alberta. Let's focus more on compliance to make sure that people understand what the laws are versus you know, cracking down and criminalizing individuals that just a, a month ago were law abiding uh, in what they were doing and uh, simply we're making sure we use common sense in this approach. And, and I'm sorry, Neil, in terms of your question about taking legal action against Ottawa, we are uh, seriously considering that. We believe, uh, based on the ad advice we've received to date, and we'll get more from the uh, advisory committee, we believe that uh, individual citizens who are impacted uh, by these new regulations uh, would, would have stronger standing uh, in a court challenge, and we are... Uh, Act, serious about potentially coming in um, to support a legal action by uh, an individual citizen or a group of citizens uh, through uh, by obtaining an intervener status to support such a challenge. And I see that the government of Saskatchewan uh, ha is also considering that. So we might enter into so the support of a legal challenge of a private citizen with other provincial governments. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? We have Rob McAnally with CTV. Go ahead, Rob. 
Hi, this question is for the Premier, and thanks kindly for taking it. Uh, I did want to ask you about uh, the pride flag that was, was flown on the grounds. Uh, there are members of the LGBTQ2 plus community who are concerned that it, it only was up for the one day. Uh, firstly, are there any plans for the government to revisit having the pride flag flown? And can you tell me a little bit about the uh, policy regarding your flag protocols? There's nothing on here that suggests, on your website, that suggests um, that they only fly for one day. So any insight you can provide on that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. To be honest with you, I don't know uh, who controls the flag policy. I, I, I thought it was the legislature. It's a legislature building in part. So um, I, I do know that, that uh, I believe Minister here uh, participated in a pride, pride flag raising ceremony to recognize June as Pride Month. And then also a Filipino flag was raised the next day to recognize a Filipino Heritage Month. So the, the flag poles that stand outside the federal building are used for multiple different uh, celebrations and commemorations. Uh, and uh, so I think they, they, they cycle through different flags to recognize different um, important dates and, and uh, commemorations. And uh, beyond that, I, 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 again, I, I'd be happy to have our uh, office get back in touch with you to clarify whether that's the legislature responsibility or, or government, because I'm, I'm simply not uh, clear on that myself. Operator, can you please pick through the next caller? Next is Scott Dipple with CBC. Go ahead, Scott. Hi, just a couple of uh, quick questions for Minister Schweitzer. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned that the funding would be for 750 tests per year from Alberta, is that correct? <clears throat> it ha it'll have the capacity to test up to 750 firearms per year through the new uh, firearms lab. Okay, is that, uh, is that a ballpark figure for the number of tests coming out of Alberta to the federal lab? Uh, on average, Alberta has about 600 cases that go to the federal lab per year. Uh, so this would give us more than enough capacity, we believe, to handle uh, any uh, heightened needs in any given year. Operator. Okay, and just one other quick point. Uh, could I find out, uh, do you know if other provinces also do not rely on the federal RCMP lab? Uh, well, perfect example, the city of Calgary and city of Edmonton have their own labs as well. So this is not uh, something that's uh, abnormal. This is just a strategic investment, and we're building on what we have here in the province of Alberta. Okay, we have time for two more. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Kelly Kreiderman with Globe and Mail. Go ahead, Kelly. Hi there. Thank you for taking my question. I'm wondering now that um, Bill 1 has passed, uh, the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, whether uh, you, the Premier, will be reassuring Albertans that their ability to, uh, for the right for free expression association will continue. There has been a lot of concerns about that, and I'm wondering how the bill will be implemented. I'm also wondering, Premier, if you are concerned that people who are worried about the economic impact of the shutdowns associated with COVID are not being represented in Canadian politics today. Hmm. Okay, so on, on Bill 1, uh, yes, this is the Crit Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, and it, 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 we've been clear as, we, as uh, possible from day one that this in no way impairs uh, legal, legitimate, constitutionally protected uh, protests. We, uh, our government respects freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the legitimate exercise of those freedoms, in, including uh, political protests. Uh, this bill was targeting uh, uh, unlawful blocking of critical infrastructure in a way that threatens public safety. Uh, so holding a, a political uh, protest to make your point, whether it's support or opposition to a pipeline, for example, uh, is something that we uh, will always respect and defend. But standing on a highway uh, or a or railway tracks or other critical infrastructure in a way that can create a uh, a threat to, to to human life to public safety and at the same time uh, it illegally impair uh, Canadians livelihoods that is not lawful protest and so all bill one does is to strengthen uh, provincial administrative penalties against those who illegally and dangerously block a critical infrastructure. It in no way impairs uh, lawful protest. On your second question, 
I think that's a, a very interesting question that the um, uh, Certainly here in Alberta, we, we saw, I believe, some 25,000 uh, businesses, about 15% of businesses that operate in the province whose operations were uh, significantly affected, in most cases suspended, because of recent public health measures. Uh, and uh, that is exactly why uh, we have been moving forward with our relaunch strategy. Um, I think that, and it's also why we have provided 12, uh, over $12 billion in Alberta's fiscal response to the COVID crisis, uh, including in the case of employers, uh, covering over $300 million in their WCB premiums, cutting non-residential property taxes, deferring those taxes, deferring utility payments, um, and, and other measures. We'll, we'll also be announcing additional support uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises that were affected by public health orders uh, over the past 10 weeks, uh, and recognizing that uh, those businesses were uh, hugely affected due to no fault of their own. Um, and uh, so I, I, I just uh, offer this as well, this context in, in, Al in terms of Alberta. Um, I'm proud that Alberta has been able to maintain uh, th some of the least stringent public health restrictions uh, in the Western world over the past two and a half months, uh, while achieving some of the best public health results. Um, the, uh, you know, just to give you an example, in Ontario and Quebec, uh, they shut down all of manufacturing and most of construction. Um, in, in, in Quebec, they've had, uh, in many parts of Quebec, uh, uh, it, it was not permitted for more than, for anybody to meet. Uh, we've had a limit of 15 people at events or, or gatherings here in Alberta. Our assessment is that we've had the, uh, the least stringent public health measures in uh, amongst the least restringent in the Western world, with the exception of perhaps some Midwestern US states and, and Sweden, famously. Uh, and yet, we have been at, at the bottom of the curve in terms of per capita infections, hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and uh, deaths. So that is, I believe, a, a confirmation of the personal and social responsibility demonstrated by Albertans over the past several weeks. Uh, and uh, and I, we want to, once again, um, uh, that's one of the reasons we're looking forward at accelerating uh, phase two of relaunch and bringing some of the uh, phase three aspects forward as well. Okay, one more question. Operator, can you put through the last caller, please? The final question is Audrey Nouveau with Radio Canada. Go ahead, Audrey. Hi, Premier. Uh, my question is for you in French, uh, as usual. Um, Est-ce que vous pouvez me dire en quoi ces mesures vont aller euh, convaincre le fédéral de ne pas aller trop loin dans leur pouvoir sur les armatures? Est-ce que ça va vraiment changer quoi que ce soit face à M. Trudeau? Oui. Tout d'abord, nous croyons que le gouvernement fédéral a raté euh, le cible parce qu'il met l'accent sur les réglementations qui ne sont pas raisonnables contre les euh, propriétaires des armes à feu euh, légaux, les gens qui, les, les, euh, les, agri les agricultures, euh, les chasseurs, les gens qui, depuis toute leur vie, ont possédé les armes à feu de façon entièrement légale et sûre. Euh, pour nous autres, le cible doit être euh, euh, les euh, criminels qui importent euh, les armes à feu euh, illégaux euh, des États-Unis. 80 des armes à feu qui sont uti utilisées dans les, la Commission des crimes au Canada sont, euh, viennent des États-Unis de façon illégale. Alors, ça doit être l'accent de, de, de l'action. Nous autres, nous appuyons au, en Alberta le contrôle des armes à feu raisonnable. Euh, euh, et, euh, mais euh, on va défendre les propriétaires euh, légaux. Euh, euh, nous considérons euh, euh, l'action euh, légale dans les cours pour appuyer une... Euh, 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 les, les, les propriétaires contre les réglementations fédérales 
Deuxièmement, nous avons créé ce uh, comité avisoire pour donner le gouvernement provincial uh, uh, le, le, uh, le, la considération des propriétaires des armes à feu en Alberta à cet égard. Troisièmement, on va créer un officier provincial pour uh, mettre en vigueur les réglementations en ce qui concerne les armes à feu. Et uh, enfin, on va ramener ici, en Alberta, euh, une, euh, euh, notre propre euh, laboratoire pour aider la prosecution euh, des, des criminels qui, qui utilisent les armes à feu. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.